YouTube, Spotify, and uh, definitely Apple Cast one day. Right, Josh? Welcome uh, back. This one, I, I, I promise this one is going to be up on Apple. Eventually. So, uh, big special episode today because we have the meta shifting, the game changing, the nightmare of Phantoms booster box release uh, this week. And uh, yeah, we've got a whole bunch of new archetypes, new decks shaking up the meta. And we're going to be going through basically all the archetypes is how we've decided to yeah. break this one down this week, haven't we? Yeah. Also, as of today, uh, day of recording, also relevant for Master Duel players because the Snake Eye cards, which definitely are going to be mentioned at, at one point or another today, um, also releasing in Master Duel or already out, had, had the pleasure of playing uh, the new Master Duel format for the entire stream already. And um, yeah, relevant for, for both formats now, interestingly enough. Strangely enough, I find that uh, they're basically identical between TCG and uh, Macedo. There's a couple of niche differences, you know. Yeah, we can just... we can mention the differences when we get to it because uh, the TCG version of the deck is even more powerful. But uh, yeah. we'll get to that. Yeah. Uh, I think we can probably just jump straight in, right? We're just going to break this down yeah. by the archetypes. So in general, yeah. I suppose we can set the premise real quick. We're coming off of the back of like a quote unquote fake format. We've just had a. Uh, Forbidden Limited list dropped just, you know, like a month ago or something. Yeah. And we've been in this little kind of lull period for a little bit where yeah. Fire Kings have been basically dominating. Um, we've seen a couple of... Uh, it's still been pretty diverse, to be fair. It's, it's been very diverse. I wouldn't even call it Fire King dominating. I think the reason why Fire King has been super, super prevalent when it comes to deck breakdowns is that most people just had their the hands on the cards already. Like, they've been getting their wanted engines and their fire king cards ready for this format and like why would you pick up a different deck for a couple weeks where there's no ycs right and so i think that's why people had the cards anyways and that's why they decided to just play a lot of fire king because we didn't even see fire king do that well like a lot of people played it but it didn't actually win that much so um I, I mean, think it I was more like in anticipation for this one i was just really shocked and surprised to see that even before um was it Bologna? I think there was like like one or two mm -hmm. like pure Fire King tops. That was like really crazy. Yeah, uh, the deck is the deck is quite cool even in the pure version before the Snake Eye cards. Because to be honest, the the deck that we're gonna be seeing a lot more now is arguably more of a Snake Eye deck than a Fire King deck. You know, it's like it's like a Snake Eye deck with a small Fire King engine. It's gonna play a lot different from what you have in the in the pure Fire King deck right now, right? Um, but yeah, I think it's I think it's it's worth just starting with the with the Snake Eye cards when we look at different archetypes for Phantom Nightmare, simply because it is going to be the most relevant deck in the upcoming format, and it's also gonna like whenever we talk about different archetypes, we're gonna have to circle back to how does this deck perform against Snake Eye variations. Um, so I think it just makes sense if we hop into the the Snake Eye cards first when we look at Phantom Nightmare now. So off the bat, like in terms of the meta breakdown, do you think you're expecting to see like, you know, um, a, a strict sort of like kind of head and shoulder gap ahead of the meta for Snake Eyes and Snake Eye variants? Um, yeah, yeah, no, I, I don't know. I guess I don't want to get into the discussion exactly of if it's, if it's going to be a tier zero deck or not, because everyone's everyone like depending on who you ask, you get a different answer on what exactly makes a tier zero deck. I think there's definitely potential to experiment with a lot of different Snake Eye variations. Um, but to be honest, after having taken a look at the cards in both TCG and Master Duel, I see very little reason from a competitive standpoint to play a deck that doesn't have those cards in it because they are um, very, very strong, very, very resilient to all sorts of interruptions. You know, they play great into boards. They play great into, into certain hand traps that are being used. And they just create a lot of card advantage without being weak to anything, anything in particular. Because their their interruptions are also going to be quite layered in their end board. It's not like you can just slap one dark ruler on the deck and and call it a day. So it's just um, it's it's quite the dominant strategy, I think. Yeah, I mean, we are going to be focusing on the competitive aspect in the discussion of this, uh, mm -hmm. but obviously, it can't be uh, understated just how. Unfortunate it is that for a lot of people, they will just be priced out of this meta. Um, oh, yes. No, it... that's that's probably... Uh, I mean, we've touched on this this topic, I think, in the very first episode, because it was a very... Um, I mean, it's it's always an ongoing debate in Yu-Gi-Oh, right? But specifically at that time, Bonfire release and, uh, and all that, you know, it's, it's definitely going to be a thing. And we're going to touch on some alternatives because Phantom Nightmare does not only bring Snake Eyes to the table. There is some other stuff in there 
and obviously also decks that already exist before Phantom Nightmare, that while not the best deck in the format, they're not completely like out of the equation. Like the, the fire decks are going to be the best and the most popular, but I don't think it's completely impossible to to compete with them, which is also shown by current OCG uh, metagame breakdowns where we constantly see other decks like Voiceless Voice um, perform as well, right? But yeah, we're going to touch on that as well. But to... Just as a brief introduction to why Snake Eye is going to be so relevant after Phantom Nightmare, it's only actually it only really comes down to two cards, which is kind of uh, you know it's kind of incredible that two cards can change the entire fate of of the entire archetype. I mean, the Snake Eye cards that already are out there are already good cards. You know, like you look at Flamberish Dragon, you look at Snake Eye Ash, um, those kind of cards are already. You, you look at them and you're like, those are pretty good cards. But what really tips the entire archetype over the edge is really, I mean, Snake Eyes Poplar, as it's called, previously known as Populous, um, which is pretty much, you couldn't have made a better card for Snake Eyes, I want to say, because it has so many different effects that are good for the deck. Um, you know, first things first, it lets you special summon itself when it's added to the hand, except by drawing. So it is, it's a premier search target for Snake Eye Ash. Um, when it's normal or special summon, it adds any Snake Eye spell trap from the deck to the hand, which is obviously, you know, you summon a Snake Eye Ash, add that thing to your hand, special summon it, get another plus one from it. And when it gets sent to the graveyard, it puts a fire monster from your graveyard into your spell and trap zone, which can also obviously be used very well in Snake Eye decks too, because they all send face-up cards you control to the graveyard, you know, for for Snake Eye, o Snake Eye Oak or Ash effect to summon from the deck, for um, original Sinful Spoils, for Diabell Star, so many different ways to make use off of that card in your spell and trap zone. Um, that populace in itself basically just does everything the deck ever would ever want, right? Um, I think the uh, gap there is is massive, right? Because previously Snake Eyes was basically just a supplementary engine for anything that was, yeah. uh, you know... Um, a yeah. fire deck, right? Uh, haha, engine, no mm -hmm. pun intended, but it really I mean, it, made like yeah. Rescue Ace go from like this kind of okay deck that was good, but just this very sort of inconsistent kind of bricky deck. And specifically, specifically, the difference here is what you're referring to is just the Diabell Star cards, right? Because previously, you would only play yeah, exactly. like Diabell Star yeah. Wanted and Original Sinful Spoils in any deck that wants to tutor a level one fire. You know, occasionally, some of the Fire King decks have been playing like one Snake Eye Ash or maybe one Snake Eye Oak. But for the most part, it was just really about the tutoring power of Diabell Star, right? And that's, that's the big change that's going to happen is previously, you would have a deck with a very small Diabell Star engine. Now it's more like you have a full fleshed out Snake Eye deck and your Fire King portion is actually the side hustle, you know? Like that's not the main thing that your deck is doing anymore. Like your main combo potential comes from the Snake Eye cards because with Populous or Poplar, they actually do enough and more than enough to, to win the game on their own. It's just more like, what do you pair up with them to make them even stronger, right? Um, but even pure Snake Eyes is going to be a viable strategy. Um, yeah, I've been really sure. enjoying it because, uh, you know, like you said, Masado has it now. And I decided to uh, do a little bit of playing with it this morning. And one of the real reasons I love decks like this when they're the best decks mm -hmm. is um, I feel like a deck like Snake Eyes Pure has so much skill expression. There is a big difference yeah. between like an average and a really good Snake Eyes players. Yeah. Just practicing it um, earlier this morning, um, yeah. obviously being incredibly good at the game uh, that I am, like uh, it, is, it, is, it is genuinely fun to like work out different lines yeah. and stuff uh, based on like what you're trying to play around. Like, you know, a, 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 I would assume probably not a great Snake Eyes player will absolutely just like int like constantly into things like Nibiru. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah. Nibiru, I've noticed, like doesn't actually do anything to the deck if you play the combo out correctly. Um, it really is a deck that slices through disruption, and I can definitely see better players like taking full use of just mm -hmm. the different pathways that you have at any one time. If you just open like something like Bell Star and Ash, right? Like uh, that can yeah. just kind of go anywhere, uh, depending on what you're trying to play around and or what you're trying to greed into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been enjoying it a lot as well. Obviously, today was also my first time actually playing with the cards. You know, I'm not the type of person to, uh, you know, take decks months before they release and, and and test them myself. I've looked at them, of course. I've looked at the lines. I've looked at what they're capable of. But today was my first day of actually playing the deck. And I 100% noticed that, you know, it's not the easiest deck to immediately pick up. You know, I've been I've been learning a lot throughout the stream. And I've been enjoying the deck a lot. Because especially in Master Duel right now, it's finally felt like 
um, I've been able to play a deck that I thoroughly like enjoy and is actually really good as opposed to like, you know, I, I know like Super Heavy Samurai is good, but I'm not enjoying that that much. Um, I think what uh, I really I, love I, about I, it, honestly, I, is that I, it feels very, um, what's, what's the way to describe it? I don't know if I'd say like new player friendly, but it does have like a very low ceiling and a very high ceiling. I think it's very good entry level. Like there is like a basic combo that you can learn. But if you if you get really good at the deck, like you can absolutely find like huge different uh, pathways and lines yeah. that help you play through this. Yeah. I, th I think it's like quite relatively simple to get into, um, mm -hmm. and I just I just love decks like that honestly because it, it yeah. does like offer a newer player or less experienced player like some ways to like you know practice combo decks. You know, going back mm -hmm. to last week, is it a combo deck? Is it not? But you know, obviously, it clearly <laughs> has a lot of different steps to it. Yeah. Um, so there are ba very basic linear lines with just Ash or just Poplar, right? You can learn them, uh, but you can further develop and advance on those depending on different tech cards you play in your extra deck. You know, if you want to end on like a Pit Knight, if you want to play around Nibiru, um, I, I just, I can't, I can't st state enough like how much I've genuinely been enjoying it. Um, mm -hmm. But it's just a, a, again, like for me personally, I won't be playing it in real life. Um, I just don't want to, um, and you know, pick up three bonfire. I, I just yeah. don't want to do that. Um, mm -hmm. But it really is like super, super fun. Um, and it yeah. just, you know, that that big uh, gap between like a good snake eye player and a really good snake eye player is something we're definitely going to be seeing at future events. Yeah, and I, I want to say that because I've, I've made comparisons today on stream between like how i really enjoy fire as like snake eyes over enjoying that not not enjoying something like a minadium or or um what's it called super heavy samurai and some people in my chat were like how is it different you know this deck is so strong that uh it's gonna it's basically gonna take over the game anyways like how is this healthy right and i i want to preface this by saying i absolutely think that the snake eye cards are 100% all better than anything else they've probably ever printed or anything that's currently legal, right? And so they are 100% ever turn. printed. I mean, I, you, you can name like cards that are banned and that are probably better, but like they are as an archetype, like it's an incredibly powerful archetype, uh, and definitely better than everything that's currently legal. And it's going to um, overtake the the format by storm, both formats, Master Duel and TCG, and so. While it could even result in something like a tier zero format or something like that, that still, to me, does not necessarily make it. Um, well, I mean, unfair is 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 a hard thing to answer, but I think some, something like that is only like unfair, quote unquote, if if both players are not operating at the same power level, right? Like, yes, you're right. It forces you to also play a fire deck if you want to compete at the same power level, because there is no other deck operating currently at the same power level right and so you can think of that what you will but it doesn't necessarily make bad Yu-Gi-Oh only because it's being played at a higher power level right you can have good Yu-Gi-Oh at low power levels you can have good Yu-Gi-Oh at high power levels it just matters that both decks are operating at similar power is you know what I'm what I'm trying to get towards yeah I think like uh Spyro being the best deck was like not great um, but something it like depends Snake on Eyes. the deck, one hundred percent. Only because two decks are the same power doesn't mean it's healthy. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I don't think anyone was enjoying certain mirror matches. Than... But other mirror matches yeah. are going to be great, right? Like tier mirror matches, notoriously like you know, big huge exactly. divide between like tier and the rest of the meta. Um, yeah. But anyone who was playing tier was having a great time, and I think it's probably going to be this, in the same situation, right? I think Snake Eyes is going to be pretty. Uh, you, you're going to have to be pretty unlucky to like lose to non Snake Eye decks. Um, Unless um, we're going to have to see exactly how big the gap is, right? Like, because I don't think anyone is questioning whether it's going to be the best or not. The question that has to be answered is how big is the gap? Like, how 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 forced are you really to play that deck specifically? Um, it's something that we can only we can only wait and see because the deck does have weaknesses. You know, like it, it plays through one hand trap incredibly well, but as soon as your opponent starts pairing hand traps. Um, it's actually not that hard to make Snake Eyes pass the turn. So, you know, in that regard, there's definitely decks that have a lot of room for non-engine that can that can keep competing in in the upcoming format. Um, but one other card that I quickly wanted to mention when it comes to, you know, just like uh, we've talked about Poplar a decent amount. I wanted to talk about Promethean Princess, which is a card that obviously is out for a while now in um master duel already and is now also out in phantom nightmare and uh, alongside popular uh, poplar those two are 
both ultra rares actually, which, you know, even though they are expensive, is probably a pleasant surprise to most people because <laughs> they were never going to be lower than ultra. It was either ultra or secret. So we kind of high rolled on both of these. Um, Super popular. Yeah. Imagine. Imagine we lived in that world. Yeah, we do not. Well, uh, <laughs> Promethean Princess, very simply put, is an um, absolutely absurd and amazing card. Link 3 Fire Monster, generic, only takes effect monsters. Revives a fire monster once per turn without even negating it. And when it's in the graveyard uh, and your opponent special summons a monster, you can pop one of your monsters, a fire monster you control, and one of their monsters. And uh, destroy both, bring it back, and it doesn't even get banished when it leaves the field. So it's both an extender, basically lets you link climb and reuse effects from the graveyard, as well as a disruption on the opponent's turn, which is one of the most powerful qualities a card from the extra deck can probably ever have. If it's, if it's both an extender that's good on, your, good on your first turn and provides a disruption on your opponent's turn that it doesn't even have to stay on the field for. And it provides that advantage on every turn of the game because it doesn't get banished. So the, the card design on that card is honestly completely unreal. The only downside to it is that it locks you into fires, but only while it's on the board. And since we have a good Link 4 fire monster in Amblo Whale um, that actually has some synergy with Promethean Princess, like that part doesn't even matter that much. Um, so yeah, Promethean Princess is just an absolutely absurd card that obviously would also benefit some other fire decks. You know, people are like, hey, have you tried Salamangrate with this card? Have you tried infernoid with this card so on and so forth and like yeah I, technically it makes those decks better as well but i mean obviously um it benefits the best fire deck the most which is going to be snake eyes yeah i think uh the subject of the power of extra deck monsters is obviously a topic in and of itself but um yeah. one of the uh quote-unquote good things i suppose is that it is kind of restrictive to fire decks but the problem is like amblo whale kind of gives it that sort of genericness which yeah. we'll see how that uh really develops going forward if people really take advantage of this being some sort of like staple kind of disruption um it's a unique i mean I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you in any deck that has extra deck space i i don't i don't think it's that un unrealistic that people are gonna just play like uh, I don't know, Hita, Promethean Princess, and Amblo Whale, because as soon as you have an Ash or your opponent has an Ash, like if you, if you have a fire monster somewhere in your deck, which I mean, with Ash being a fire monster, um, the hand trap Ash, I need to clarify, because Snake Eyes Ash is also the same name, which is probably the worst thing they could have ever done to the community, because <laughs> now we never know what we're talking about. But like, yeah, no, like any generic fire monster, if your opponent had an Ash Blossom or is playing a fire deck, you make Hita, you make Promethean Princess. You you go into Amblo Whale from just two monsters, and it's it's pretty um it's pretty good. One thing I wanted to talk about, which I think is also really really cool about this deck, is I love when decks like aren't auto build themselves, and Snake Eyes has mm -hmm. so much room for how you yeah. want to build it, right? Like it's it's quite a small engine, and you can just choose to load in a bunch of hand traps. You can play a different archetype alongside it. Mm -hmm. You can play board breakers. Um, and I think that's like really cool. Um, and I'm genuinely super super excited to see how people develop this and what kind of other strategies and stuff we incorporate and see, you know, brought back potentially, um, mm -hmm. you know, calling back to like Infernoid, uh, just playing pure with like a bunch of hand trap. Like, I, I think that's like really exciting. Um, on so the one hand, I agree with that. Um, on the other hand, this is where for me personally, the fact that the OCG has had these cards for months kind of puts a little bit of a, of a damper on how I, how excited I am, because I'm gonna be honest with you. I think, the fact that they had so much time to experiment with these cards and basically have arrived at a point where um, they've they've played so many different Snake Eye versions over the last couple of weeks and months. And they've basically, uh, yeah, like everyone in the OCG has arrived at the conclusion that the, the, the Fire King Snake Eye version is the best one. And they've streamlined it to a point where almost all of their lists look the same. And uh, I've seen people. I've seen people already start testing the deck for the TCG, and most of the lists are very, very close to what's being played in the OCG. Of course, they're just adapting a little bit to maxi meta game, right? They're taking out the maxis and some of the outs to it, replace it with other non-engine. But for the most part, the Fire King Snake Eye deck seems like it's going to be the best version, and the deck has already been almost fully figured out by the OCG. At the same time. The format is different, so maybe that that way of thinking about it is also a little bit dangerous because you might be able to improve on it still because the format's not the same, right? Maxi not existing makes it so that more combo-heavy versions that are a little bit more all-in could be better than they are in the OCG, right? The Fire King version is kind of like 
um, the Fire King engine, I should rather say, is is decent into Maxi, right? So, which is a bonus in the OCG that we don't really need in the TCG. So maybe you can maybe you can still experiment and figure something out. And I mean, most of the time, uh, when when decks come over from the OCG, they 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 see some amount of change in the TCG, right? It's it's usually not the same. Like just remember. I know the last time I remember this being a big, big difference between OCG and TCG is when Sprite completely dominated the OCG, and then Tierlament basically was the more prevalent deck in the in the in the TCG, um, which was very interesting at the time. I think the uh, discussion and topic of the merging of the formats and the staggered releases is something that's a kind of like oh yeah a big... no I didn't want to I didn't want to open that entire thing up yeah. for like I, I don't want to yeah. Um, you know, that's obviously a huge pain point for a lot of us in the TCG because, you know, yeah. we do lose a lot of that, you know, fun factor, yeah. which is deck building, right? Like a lot of people mm -hmm. sometimes just play Yu-Gi-Oh because they just enjoy the deck building process. They might not necessarily yeah. actually enjoy the dueling part that much and figuring out and coming up with like the solving of the puzzle that is trying to streamline a deck like Snake Eyes, especially when that's so open-ended. Yeah. Um, yep. is a huge uh, pull factor for a lot of players and really fun. So, you know, as you mentioned, it is um, starting to be kind of solved uh, based on the fact of its presence in the OCG. But, you know, we've seen a lot of surprises over the years, yeah. right? I think uh, there's been enough... Uh, branded comes to mind, for example, right? They were played pretty differently between the regions. Yeah. Um, we've we've yeah. seen a, a lot of, de of decks played... Um, completely different from region to region uh maxi obviously being a major factor even if we ignore the card pool in the set releases because i think tier mm. limit was really or rather i think sprite was really not as dominant in tcg as it was in ocg because i think they gave us the ashizu cards really quick didn't they uh i think it was also a matter of garura not being in the ocg but you can get into the nitty-gritty i think they had like the tier limit was already dominant before ishizu right the danger tier deck was was very relevant in in the TCG right off the bat, which wasn't something that they were doing in the OCG, uh, mainly because I I don't think they like dangerous in a maxi format that much, and I would agree with that, right? That was so yeah. that was a tool that they didn't have. They didn't have the Garura available to just go like you know make make Beatrice and all that kind of stuff that people were doing in the TCG. So um, there is a couple of key differences that can make a huge difference. So. Um, yeah, no, I'm excited regardless. Like, of course, people are going to start with that quote unquote, what they, what appears to be a solved version of the deck, Fire King Snake Eye. But I think there is a lot of potential with these cards to maybe experiment and find something that is better. And you could get rewarded, you know, if everyone's playing the standard deck and you find something that's better. You know, yeah, on the that's, that's... on the flip side, you know, conversely, the fact that it might be so streamlined and you kind of will be able to see what everyone's deck list looks like, then exactly. that might potentially give you more time and opportunity to exploit that um, and build exactly. around it. Yeah. So that kind of brings us to, I yeah. think, maybe like the final part of this. Let's talk about some yeah. of the counters and some of the ways that people can try and beat Snake Eyes. Is there any yeah. particular archetypes you can imagine seeing having good matchups or is there any sort of staple cards that are going to be good against Snake Eye? Mm -hmm. I think naturally Shifter has to be probably immediately Shifter, mentioned. Shifter decks... Uh, Shifter is one of the few cards that can beat the Snake Eye deck on its own. Uh, that is that is true. There's not many cards that... Like, there's like... Even cards like Droll and Lockbird is being hyped up a lot right now, I feel like. Everyone's talking about, oh, Droll and Lockbird is going to be in every deck. And I, I was under the impression... Uh, that that was going to be the case as well, right? Like Droll and Lockbird, uh, like I've looked at the combo and it seems like it, it searches a lot during the first turn. So naturally I thought, okay, Droll is going to be is going to be pretty strong. But then I looked at the ways that Snake Eyes have to to play under Droll and they still end on the full, um, they still end on the full end board. The, not, not the full, full end board, but they still get to do the whole Promethean Princess um, Amblo Whale setup with a, IP Mascarena in the graveyard and the Flambers Dragon, right? That's the that's the whole um, gimmick of the deck, I guess. Just to to round up the the Snake Eye talk in general, just very briefly, because when we talk about counters, we have to, to talk about what the deck actually tries to achieve. Um, obviously, you can do it in different flavors. Whether you're playing pure Snake Eye with with Jet Synchron to make like Savage or Baron, or you're playing Fire Kings in there, but as a main thing, the the deck tries to end on Amblo Whale with a Promethean Princess in the graveyard, which Promethean Princess gives you a pop. Uh, and you try to keep a Flambers Dragon on the field, which puts a monster from your own graveyard into your spell and trap zone. So normally you're going to put an IP Mascarena there or a Formula Synchron, depending on whether you're playing the Synchro version or the Link version. And then on the opponent's turn, the Flambers Dragon can, as a quick effect, summon out the monster from your continue from your spell and trap zone, and then obviously with the IP or the formula, you can quick synchro or quick link 
into you know whichever depends on the format you're playing in master duel you can't make sp but you can still make appaloosa or unicorn uh, in the tcg we're mostly going to link into sp little knight or you can synchro into baron because uh the thing is a level eight right and then Flamburst triggers again on your opponent's turn, brings back two level ones from the graveyard, which also both trigger, you know, like Ash searches follow-up, um, Populous searches another spell trap. So you have infinite follow-up. You have a lot of differently layered disruptions, you know, because your Promethean Princess is a disruption from the graveyard. You're, um, you have a Baron or an, an IP Masquerina that threatens immediate impact from the, from the hand, uh, from the field, I mean. And then when it comes to that, if you're playing the Fire King version, you can even set up interruptions from the hand through like a Kirin popping something, bringing back a Runix, going into the going into the rank eight exceed with your with your continuous spell. So it's like really hard to pinpoint one particular area where the deck is weak, right? Like you can't just dark ruler all their monsters. You can't just get rid of some of their stuff in the graveyard. You can't just get rid of their back row. They have interruptions basically coming from everywhere. And you pair that with the fact that they have phenomenal follow-up, right? And so yeah, when it comes uh... to beating that kind of strategy, I feel like there's only two real approaches. The, the, the first approach that comes to mind is just stopping it in its tracks, right? Like, uh, a, like hand hey, before traps, we uh, move on to these counters, let's just wrap up there. I think you did a really good uh, summary there. Okay. But just to, just to make sure that um, there was one point I thought was really important. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one of the mechanics that's becoming increasingly popular. Uh, we saw Centurion take advantage a lot of it, but mm -hmm. so many, so much of the Snake Eye cards just place from deck or special directly from the deck, mm -hmm. uh, which is why Droll and Lockbird um, yeah. is very kind of weak uh, against the deck. I feel like because um, yeah. you got your Sinful Spoils being placed by the Witch directly from the deck, um, yeah. the Field Spell placing Flamberge directly from the deck. Um, yeah. So so much placing. No, I, happening. I think that's one hundred percent. That's one hundred percent what they want to do with those kind of designs. They are aware of the relevance of Droll and Lockbird, and they are designing new archetypes, particularly to be strong against it. And while the deck does search a couple times, you know, it just it searches exactly the right amount uh, to the point where Droll and Lockbird feels okay against it, but not completely stopping it. Yeah, which is going to be very uh, fun to play because you're not going to be super frustrated because even when you play like a, a almost potentially a tier zero deck, um, mm -hmm. it, it isn't really fun for either player because they have to stare down a tier zero deck or they yeah. get hit with some absolutely ridiculous floodgate that just completely ends the game. Um, it's funny. It's funny because playing uh, normally when you when you get trolled, there's two outcomes. You either play a deck that doesn't care about it or you play a deck that completely cries, right? <laughs> Yeah. Playing Snake Eyes is like the first time, or like the first time in a long time at least, where I feel like Droll and Lockbird is actually just an okay hand trap. Like I don't, it's not bad against me. It does something, right? Yeah. But it doesn't completely win or lose the game, right? Which honestly feels okay. It's refreshing to get hit by Droll and Lockbird and be like, ah, that's fair, you know, that's okay. It, kind of, it feels like hitting, getting hit with an effect veiler in like a normal Yu-Gi-Oh deck. My limited amount of testing, I don't feel like it's been doing enough. And I think with a, if you put a card yeah. like Droll and Lockbird in your deck, you're kind of telling to yourself, okay, I want like a sort of heavyweight like turn oh, yeah. ender. No, yeah. So I just don't think it's going to really see as much play as I think people will because mm -hmm. it just doesn't have that impact that Shifter does, right? So yeah, moving mm -hmm. on to uh, the counters and stuff, you were uh, yeah. you were giving us a rundown of some of the cool decks in Yu-Gi-Oh, like uh, Flunder, <laughs> like Cash Tira, like these are all I mean, yeah, decks like, that take uh... advantage. When it comes to a format like this, where there's clearly one deck to beat, and by by one deck I just mean all the Snake Eye decks. You know, whether it's whether it's your Rescue Ace, your uh, Fire King, your Pure Snake Eye, whatever, they all operate under the same category of like Snake Eye decks. Um, there's two options. You can either try to hand hand trap them to death, which, um, like previously discussed, can work, but not really with one singular hand trap. Um, except for Shifter. Shifter can do it. Um, which not every deck can play, but I think that is um, that is relevant for all the decks that are shifter decks potentially. You know, your Vanquish Souls, your Flu, your Cash Tira, your Exo Sister, what have you. You know, those kind of decks. You know, always when the best deck in the format is weak to shifter, they have some sort of viability. You know, think of like Tier Limit format, where literally the only actual rogue deck that was playable and saw a decent amount of tops was like Flu. And maybe some shifter sprites, right? But that alone, the fact that shifter beat the top deck was enough to to make those decks 
somewhat viable, you know? Do you remember um, when, uh, I think it was YCS Leon or something? It was like the last YCS before uh, Tier got hit. Exactly, yeah. Um, and despite Tier being full power, full yeah. power, we saw like a third of top cut was Cash Tira. Yeah, no, now, that was right after the release of Cash Tira as well. And like, uh, yeah. yeah, no, Cash Tira was doing okay. It was actually just like, I mean, it was... Just based off the fact your your Swiss rounds or your you expected to play against tier almost every single round. And so like having a deck that can main deck shifter was definitely a, an advantage. And then of course, I mean a Rysard helped a little bit too. He did some work. All right, should we move on to a new deck? Uh yeah, we can just talk about I mean we've talked about Snake Eye a lot, and honestly, you could probably fill an entire episode or multiple with like in-depth snake eye talk and what you can do with different versions and all that kind of stuff, but this is not what this is meant to be. I suppose we are talking about Phantom Nightmare in general, and Phantom Nightmare has some other interesting stuff as well, especially, um, I think a lot of the stuff is overshadowed by the power of the fire decks, right? But yeah. I think there's a lot of cards that we're going to look at today that will eventually, once we are past fire decks, right, which is eventually going to happen, the deck is not going to be the best deck forever, I think there's going to be a window to return to some of these cards um, and and be like, okay, hey, like back in the day, this wasn't good enough during Fire Format, but now uh, we can we can talk about it, right? Yeah, uh, I think I, uh, I'm going to skip ahead in our notes here because I wanted to go to, I think this one is probably the most relevant. Uh, I want to talk mm -hmm. about the um, Voiceless Voice, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. which I think is probably the best meta deck price-wise if for those of you who are looking to probably compete in the tcg i yeah i wouldn't call it a budget deck because low it's definitely not budget but it's no, certainly it's cheaper than deck. uh than the fire deck it's not a budget deck because low is unfortunately the most expensive secret rare in the set and because i think it's it's ironic because it, i think the high interest in in voices voice comes from the fact that people that don't want to invest all that money into the fire decks were like I'm going to take a look at Voiceless Voice, and that's what made it somewhat expensive now too, especially also because cards like um, the Viner have gone up a decent amount as well, uh, even though it has been reprinted in one of the Megatons. But uh, it's still, compared to, obviously compared to a Fire Deck, it's much more reasonable. That's my mistake. I uh, I thought Diviner was uh, really cheap. It turns out it has not been reprinted enough. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> it, I think it only has one reprint, genuinely. Yeah. I think it's just the Mega Pack one. I think it's it's unfortunate because I think everything else is very affordable. Um, it's just those two cards, I'm pretty sure. Um, yeah, and okay. I think Diviner, I mean, Diviner, we're not talking like 50 bucks a piece, but probably like 20. So, I mean, for, for budget players, that is, um, I, it can be an issue, right? So you're looking yeah. at low at the moment is I think upwards of 50 a piece and you need three and then the Viner is at 20. So you're looking at for those six cards, you're looking at over 200 bucks. The rest of the deck is manageable, but still it's not going to be cheap. Yeah. There's still like a couple of three of Ultras and stuff that are in Phantom Nightmare that yeah. you have to run. No, yeah, you're um, still going to have, yeah, you're going to have like it's 300 upwards plus some staples, whatever. Like it's, it's not, it's not budget for sure, but it's a lot cheaper. Like uh, that's three wanted pretty much. So it's a uh, ritual deck, uh, a deck, uh, yeah. a, a mechanic rather, that um, naturally, just by the way of power creep and the age we live in, uh, ritual summoning has to be absolutely, completely absurd. And I think this might yeah. be um, just taking that an entire new step forward because you just straight up just like, I thought megaliths were breaking the game by ritual summoning <laughs> out of the deck, but no, the, you, you just straight up just don't ritual. So you just special summon out the deck with some technically, of these cards. Yeah, right? no, like, technically, it's, it feels more like these, these ritual monsters could have any color. Like the, yeah. the cards just say special summon them by doing this or that, you know? Yeah, like, so it, it, it's not really relevant in that way, but um, <laughs> yeah. Do you want to give us a little rundown of like, what is the kind of like the basic gameplay loop of voiceless voice? Like what is, what does the deck do? It's it's very straightforward actually. It's 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 got a very linear set of lines where it just tries to end on like uh it's got low, which is the level one fairy, which basically gets the entire deck going by placing the continuous spell from your deck into the spell and trap zone. The continuous spell is really strong because it allows you to add uh, a voiceless voice uh, from the deck to the hand once per turn. And while you control low and another ritual monster, it makes your stuff untargetable, which is pretty huge. Um, and you have this humongous uh, Skull Guardian retrain, which just becomes a 4100 uh, beater, which is an Omni Negate, um, once per turn as well, not like Baron, once while it's on the field. It's just a once per turn Omni Negate. So 
Uh, and then it does uh, a decent amount of, it can also, I'm pretty sure it can ritual summon, uh, like it can actually summon Soravis, the old school Soravis, uh, which is uh, also not even that bad if you summon it onto the field because it can, uh, I think it's like a solemn warning on legs, right? Because it returns, I think it returns itself to the hand to stop a special summon. And so it's got a lot of very linear lines that end on this sort of end board um, of low skull guardian the continuous spell and if you have an extra card to spare like because you hard drew the spell card already you can also end on the continuous trap card um the thing about the deck that i first of all the thing that i like about the deck is that because it is relatively straightforward it's relatively easy to pick up and it's relatively efficient in all of its effects you're not doing too much with it you're not playing into the nibiru's of the world i'm pretty sure uh, it plays into Droll and Lockbird some amount, but it depends how you build your deck as well. You know, I've seen people in the OCG play cards like Pre-Preparation of Rights, Nadir Servant, all that kind of stuff. You know, the more of those you play, the weaker it's going to be from uh, to Droll and Lockbird, but you can you can cut down on some of these cards and make it more resilient to that. But um, in general, it's very efficient. Uh, it's got one-card combos uh, with the Viner and Low and all that kind of stuff. The only thing that I think is actually hurting it a little bit uh, is that it... The main reason, I think, why it's so good in the OCG, and to be clear, it's the second best deck in the OCG right now, is the fact that it's it probably cares about Maxi the least out of any deck in the game in over there right now, unless you're playing a stun deck. Because you get to yeah. that end board position in one, maybe two special summons most of the time, sometimes three, but usually it's like, you know, don't even have to do that many under under maxi and you still get to end on like omni negate trap card you play a lot of non-engine in the deck and that factor of maxi not existing might make it just a little bit too fair yeah i think that's always been a defining factor between the regions it's like you know yeah. um branded is just was just so good over there because it did yeah. so much off of like two summons or something whereas yeah you um, you really underestimate how like basically there's a lot of decks in the ocg that take that trade off right they'll be like okay my deck is not as powerful not as explosive as other decks in the format but for whatever how often the maxi resolves for my opponent i'm not going to be phased by it that much right and so you're trading some like your win rate is going to be lower in terms of sometimes your board just isn't strong enough your opponent just is able to play through it but on the other hand you lose less games to max c right and you take that trade off right and overall that still makes your deck pretty good right because you get to win games with max c and your opponent doesn't always win the game with max c is that there a lot of uh hmm? sorry you can finish your thought there no, I was just going to say that factor alone, I think, is something that can't be understated with Maxi not being in the TCG. Because sometimes it just ends yeah. up being those decks are just too fair. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, one of the cool things as well was like being able to just ha like have an explosive crazy deck, but that also has plays under Maxi, right? Like, I mean, yeah, that's ideal, right? That's yeah. the that's the ideal world, yeah. Yeah, okay, Kalos Ad Selic is just great over oh, there. Oh yeah, that was that um, was one of the no, that was one of the one of the main reasons why it was even possible for that deck that deck to be tier zero is because it had ways to completely ignore Maxi. Like it was so good to the point that you didn't even have to play. Like Tielemans was one of the first best decks in the OCG, I think, ever, that didn't even have to bother with playing Ash Blossom for Maxi, because it just legitimately mattered so little. Yeah, just play 40 engine or whatever. Um, I yeah. was going to ask, uh, with the voiceless voice, um, do you know if, I don't know how much you've done in testing wise, probably not as mm -hmm. much, um, but do you know if there's like any like super relevant like clutch points and and, uh, and things like that? Because I, I think that's maybe one of like the most important factors when developing a meta of like a new deck, right? If like if you spot mm -hmm. specifically like, you know, Snake Eyes loses to something on okay. this point, right? Like that becomes yeah. way, way more manageable. But unlike, uh, but unlike Snake Eyes, which doesn't really have like a huge um, pain point, uh, I, I don't mm. know if uh, Voiceless Voice has that. Uh, I would say preventing. I mean, if you see the Viner, I would I would say you try to negate that because the way the the way the Viner even is a starter card for the deck is because. They actually play this level nine fairy. I think it's called Trias Hierarchia, right? Um, just so they can immediately tribute the Diviner. As opposed to other ritual decks, they don't even send like Herald to search a ritual monster. They actually send that level nine 
uh, fairy to tribute the diviner to tutor the low from the deck. That's how important the low is. So if you ever catch them normal summoning a diviner, you immediately know, okay, they, they are trying to get too low. Uh, and if you can imperm or veiler that diviner, there's a there they need to have a pretty good hand to be to recover from that. The same is true about the continuous spell. The continuous spell is pretty important for them. If you ever have um, like a card that's very popular in the OCG, especially in side decks right now, is is Cosmic Cyclone, right? If because it's good against the Fire King, continuous spell and traps, you can hit the the thing that Diabellstar sets, but also very importantly, hitting the hitting the the Voiceless Voice continuous spell with it is is pretty damn huge. Um, uh, which is also true for something like uh, if you want to cite something specifically for this deck, I think something like Ghost Ogre wouldn't be outrageous to just hit that continuous spell. Interesting. Um, yeah, so uh, the uh, the deck itself, I think, is going to be a decent contender. Um, I feel like, personally, in the TCG, uh, we could see some more explosive variants of Snake Eye appear, and I don't know if yeah. um, Voiceless Voice is really going to have like the oomph behind it to really it's, deal with some of the Snake Eye top decks. It's very similar to Centurion in the way that it has a solid one-card combo line. It has also some solid two-card combo lines, but it's very hard for the deck to go higher in terms of its ceiling right because theoretically you could look at it and be like okay in the tcg you don't have to worry about maxi can i make this deck more do more right and i think voiceless voice is very limited in in that regard like it, it's ha it has a solid and efficient lines but it's hard to make it do more than that all right anything else you want to mention about voiceless voice uh no even though i mean yeah i could just i guess as a quick closing thought is like i do think the deck has potential i think it's a good more budget option than than fire kings i am saying more budget because it's definitely not budget but it's more budget than fire um i think it's okay um but i think it's the ocg makes it look better than it is essentially but it's still going to be fine I have a sn sneaky feeling that it might be a little bit overhyped in the tcg we'll see mm -hmm. how it plays out though um yeah, but i, I uh i just that's my prediction for the upcoming format is i don't think voices voice is going to be as good as people think um mm -hmm. can we move on to a new deck we can move on yeah all right i uh wanted to go to this one next here uh magic specters it is a, a couple of cards that we've seen uh being uh mm -hmm. being supported here there's a very very powerful uh Link monster in play here, and yeah. design wise, you know, it, it isn't going to be played as a as a pile deck. Um, I would yeah. think just because the way it locks you is is uh, yeah, it it basically locks you into Magispecta specifically or like wind spellcasters or something. Yeah, just just um, for context, like uh, it it's Magispecta Link Two requires two pendulums, including a Magispecter, and just adds two face up Magispecters from your extra deck to your hand. To and the extra deck, actually, to, right? Huh? I think it adds to the extra deck, not to your hand, correct? No, it's you can add up to two face-up Magispector Pendulums from your extra deck to your hand. Then oh, wow. you can add up to two Magispector Pendulums with different names from your deck to your extra deck. Right, okay, yeah, it's, it's even better than I thought. <laughs> yeah, no, that card is a, it's a custom card, so, basically. Yeah, in an ideal world, you would want to make this before Pendulum Summoning, and you would retrieve two that are already stuck in the extra deck back to your hand and put two others from your deck into the extra deck. So then you can Pendulum Summon the two from your hand and the two from your extra deck, because it also gives you two arrows. Yeah, which is uh, pretty easy to do now before your Pendulum Summon. So previously, yeah. um, one of the biggest problems with Pendulum um, sometimes is like the amount of starters they have don't really give them mm -hmm. enough ways to get the correct Link Monsters onto the field before your Pen Summon. Because ideally, yeah, that was like the, the original problem after Master Rule changes to, to the Pendulum. Like, yeah, like, like you, the fact that you needed to summon them to Link Zones, right? Yeah, you want to be, be Pen Summoning into these zones before... Uh, well, after yeah. you've established those link monsters, um, and mm -hmm. uh, you know the uh, new card, uh, the porcupine. I can't remember its exact name. Uh, you got three of that just says special summon um, to yeah. the field here. So you can immediately go into your magic specter link, coupled with the fact that Bumbuku is just a normal summon that searches any specter. That's six copies plus the quick play spell now, which tributes uh, to add. Um, that's more. Uh, you got the field yeah. spell. You've got so many ways to to pendulum uh, to special summon or get yeah. to. Uh, your link to before your pen summon that I think that this deck is, uh, you know, potentially going to be a lot more consistent than it's ever been. Well, definitely going to be it, more consistent than it's ever been. Yeah, it's definitely looking consistent and also solid. The, the, but you mentioned two important things. Like the first thing is that obviously you're going to, in order to get 
the maximum or any value from that magic specter link monster you have to summon it before pendulum summoning um but it does lock you into magic specters for the rest of the turn which means that those two things combined you know i have to make it before i pendulum summon and then i can only summon magic specters makes it very very limited to it's basically you can only play this deck as its own deck you cannot do like a pendulum pile sort of thing where you can just use some magic specter cards and make it do even more than it already did um it's uh well the lock is only from the extra deck but still i mean that's where pendulum's most interactive stuff comes from like when it comes to making omni negates and all that kind of stuff right you want to be summoning stuff from the extra deck which you can't do um in this case right what i will say is um yeah, I, I I think number one design wise, I think that is kind of cool, right? I, I don't think um yeah. I I really like seeing every pen deck devolve into like this extra deck turbo nonsense that you know like I mean, I mean specifically if you think of like other cards that have been made for some niche archetype and then ended up never seeing play in that archetype, but only in other decks, you know, looking at cards like I don't know, Halka Fibrax comes to mind. Yeah, you know, like well, it's, if okay, listen, you definitely played support, Hulk and Christron. It just wasn't as good as you know. The I mean, yeah, stuff. they played it, but like it made every other deck much better than Christron ever. Like it, it never benefited Christron in any way okay, because you know, it, it was just meta in other decks, and then it got banned. So, yeah, everyone always forgets Verte is actually a Predator Plant monster. That's, that's oh, for cool. example, too. Yeah, no, there's like so many of these examples. You know, Electromite is still banned, even though it was gonna be like you know, if that thing was limited to Metal Foe decks they would really appreciate that help, right? And so I think that's one thing they did right with this Magic Spectre thing, because if this thing is ever going to be relevant, it's only going to benefit pure Magic Spectres, which is probably what it's meant to do. So that's cool. Yeah, so I was going to mention that I think that, you know, design-wise, I really love that, right? Like, they're not going mm -hmm. in the direction of here is a uh, pile of extra deck monsters uh, that this yeah. deck is going to spit out, right? Like, put it this way. Yeah. Like, when Pendulum starts ending on things like Heretic Seals, that's when you know things are, like, ridiculous in terms of what well, this I, deck I'd is. I'd say Heretic Seal is okay, but yeah, I, I know... In Pendulum? Mean. Okay, chill. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'd be more worried about... What Dragon yeah, Pendulums Lose are good. For four. Yeah, okay, fair. All those, <laughs> all, all those players, I'm sorry for upsetting you. Uh, but anyway, um, so the reason I wanted to go to this is that if there ever was maybe like a, a sleeper pick against Snake Eyes, I was maybe considering Magic Spectre. One of the main okay. reasons is that it has the niche that no other archetype does. It, all of your Magic Spectres are target and destruction immune. Um, and now in a deck whose main interruption is destroying your cards and targeting your cards... Perhaps, maybe, as a rogue pick, uh, Magic Spectre mm -hmm. could potentially have a little bit of um, bit of bit of meta relevance against Snake Eye, right? You see, you you say this, but then the only card that is not targeting is the link to. Link to. <laughs> yes, it Which annoys just, me if you throw so much. One targetable card into a deck that is completely untargetable, and you also make it the most powerful card in the deck. Your it's, opponent's negation, they they don't even have a chance to waste their imperm on your noble. That's opponent. so funny. Yeah, because they, they can't even they like can't waste that imperm. misplay. Like if as, <laughs> imagine in Master Duel, like your opponent has a handful of hand traps, they can't even misplay with it them. It doesn't glow. As soon as they glow up, as soon as they glow, they're gonna be used correctly <laughs> because yeah. it's on the link monster. Yeah, you can't even like go Bambuco effect and then just no, get Valor to be anything. like, ah, lucky, you know? No, it's, yeah, it's... And that's the thing about, I mean, obviously, I think it's good that that thing is targetable because otherwise, you know, it's it's just a link monster that goes essentially plus two or something like that. So it's good that you can interact with it. At the same time, obviously, it's like this huge sort of weak spot for these sort of decks com comparable to like a junk speeder situation almost where you're going to build your entire deck around that card because let's be real currently there's no other reason to really pick up a magic specter deck it's only because that new card comes out and you're like okay maybe now there's a chance but whenever decks have this one huge weak spot i think that is always a bad sign especially in a format where i think valor and imperm are going to be decently popular at least for now yeah, um, it, it it genuinely, I think, like, that is, like, the main thing is why, like, you know, we talk about choke points in Yu-Gi-Oh! We talk about, like, hey, you know, what, what should I hand trap? What should I stop? Um, yeah. This is a deck that suffers from, like, one of the most egregious, like, choke points, which is a yeah. fart in the wind on your Link 2 is, like, very, very rough. Um, and, <laughs> and it's usually not something that the, the best decks in the game have. Usually when you look at the best decks in the game, you're like, okay, well um the hand traps hand traps can be good against them but it's often the case that they are, they have ways to deal with it right they have ways to play around it they have ways to extend past it with magic specter i'm not sure 
how well you're going to be able to deal with a negation on the link monster. Yeah. Um, the, to be fair, there is uh, they have some tools. You know, they have the new quick play spell, which is essentially I don't know how I would describe it. It's basically like a it's like a heavenly dragon circle for the yeah. uh, for the deck is probably you do the best lose the link error, though, which is a big deal, I think. Yeah. Um, but still, resolving that is like super yeah. important. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Six, uh, three copies of that is is uh, is pretty good for the deck. So mm -hmm. um, I think like with the destruction target protection, um, something that could maybe help it against Snake Eye. Um, and it just yeah. controls the field really well because you have like constant like grind game with like being able to recycle your trap cards, your spell cards from your graveyard. Uh, obviously, mm -hmm. Pendulum is pen summoning every turn is really strong. But again, that kind of ties into the issue of Master Row 4. Pen Soul Charge every turn was crazy pre-Master Row 4, right? But nowadays... Yeah. You Without have to reset arrows. up. You have to set up another link monster every time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um. But yeah, it's but, uh, it's yeah. it's an okay deck, and I, I think it's dirt cheap as well. Like, I'll I'll give cheap. you that. It's the kind of deck that I wouldn't be surprised at least to see someone do well with it at a at a tournament. Just because if you play it well and you have a good day with it, you know, maybe go first a couple times uh, against Snake Eyes. I, I I it's not it's not a deck where I I would say like you have no chance of doing well. Like it's certainly a viable strategy in that regard. So it's going to go into like the I think it goes into that sort of tier 2 tier 3 rogue situation of a deck that can 100% take games off of the of the good decks in the format if piloted right and with a little bit of luck. Ah, uh, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Um yeah, I think there was one thing else I wanted to mention about Matter Spectre, but um, it uh, appears to have eluded me right now. Uh, oh, yeah. that was it. Um, were you shocked to see that they didn't bring back Kirin in the last list? Uh, a little bit. I was expecting it. I think it... I, I, I thought about it, and I mean, uh, I often have these moments where I get flashbacks of cards when they were super powerful at their peak, right? And I'm like, can Kirin come back? And at first I'm like, no. But the more I think about it, the more I feel like that card could very well come back. Um, and I was a little bit surprised that they didn't do it because I feel like now would have been the time to do it, right? That would have been um, their best chance at making Magic Spectre viable. Um, you know what the best but... example of that phenomenon is? It's like, do you remember mm -hmm. in like 2014, I think, when Snatchsteel came back? And it was like very relevant, right? Like it was just this yeah. like horribly annoying card that you would just get sacked by and it was always relevant if your opponent dropped it. Um, but then today, in 2024, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. when Snatchsteel came back, like... You know, I my instant I mean, reaction was holy crap, but it, it's just it's useless. No, it's another so the, the perfect example too is like freaking spellbooks and dragon rulers. Because if you ask anyone who played in 2013, like, do you think those cards are are like too powerful? Eh? They would all say, yeah, never bring these back, ban them forever. They can never come back. And now both of them are back, uh, like judgment and dragon. They do nothing. Yeah. So uh, I think I think Kirin honestly would be would be fine. I think I think it could it could yeah, come back. But I guess it, it's a matter of when does Konami actually you know believe that it it can come back or should come back. Yeah, I think like uh, it's 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 kind of annoying, right? Because like the deck really needs it. right? It doesn't have like a lot of it crazy does. good interruption. It does, it, it even has that tutor on one of the I think it's the exceed that it's like on the special summons. <laughs> Like, huh? It's on the artwork. Like, how do you print oh, a yeah, new card? Yeah, yeah. It summons like what does it summon? A, a wind? A wind spellcaster? What are you summoning? Oaf dragon from the yeah, deck? Yeah, you can like... summon Oaf. I think isn't Oaf dragon like the only level six target for it? It's kind of it's kind of depressing. I don't know if it's only, but like it's actually hilarious how they just yeah. it, the card was literally designed for Kirin and they didn't bring it back in <laughs> OCG or TCG. By the way, I don't know what it is. Just randomly, I think Japanese players are like really passionate about it. Because if you ever go on the Twitter posts of the new announced um, OCG lists by Konami, if yeah. you translate the comment section, oh yeah, yeah, it's always we're Kirin, we're Kirin. There's so many people asking for Kirin back of all things. It's the equivalent to whenever Masadul posts on Twitter and everyone posts that Maxi. Um, yeah, uh huh, exactly. Simplified image under it. Yeah, one day, <laughs> one day. Um, do you want to move on to like a couple of cool rogue picks? Is there anything else you want to? Yeah, I guess let's quickly up? touch on at least give everyone the opinion on all the stuff in it, just for completion's sake. You know, let's move over. Let's let's talk about Goblin Bikers, which is this like it's got two secret rares, so I'm sure a, a, a couple people are gonna pull those and be like, hey, what can I do with those? Uh, Goblin Biker is this like rank three turbo strategy, very Xyz centric, focusing around detaching Xyz material from cards that are already on the field and getting bonus effects off of that. Rank three um, I think the main Hello. reason to play that deck is the name of the boss monster, which is called Big Gabonga. <laughs> um, <laughs> 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 
Wait, what? Yeah, it's called Big Gabonga. You didn't know that? <laughs> Maybe I didn't see the localized thing yet. Was that was that out in OCG as well? No, I think it was called slightly different, but they they translated it to <laughs> Goblin Biker Big Gabonga. Man, what did they do to these cards? Anyone remember Tree Toad? <laughs> oh, wait, that's great though. I that's see. the main reason to play the deck because it's not that good. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Speaking of which, yeah, the deck is okay. It has cohesive strategy, you know, it's playable. However, I've looked at it and I just, I, I fail to see what it really does better than other decks in the format. The end boards it makes don't seem super powerful. The rank three Xyz pool. Uh, I mean, you're probably going to have a different opinion on that because you're going to say like Dante, Dante Mill 3 is insane. The rank I, three I don't Xyz pool is crazy. Tell me one thing the rank three <laughs> pool, yeah, okay, like, ha like it can out any situation. 2BA is like actually <laughs> just breaks any board. Anyway. Yeah. Back to 2024. Here we are. Uh, so, the deck uh, is the deck is fine. The deck is playable. I think it's rogue though. Um, I wonder which... if it's better as pure, or do you think it's worth mixing in punks and gold pride? I think a lot of people have been trying to. Uh... I I would have a hard time believing that the deck pure is even powerful enough. So I wouldn't be opposed to the idea of trying it. However, I haven't done that myself, so I can't really give you a hot take on you know punk uh, goblin bikers is is good or. Uh, gold pride punk goblin bikers or whatever i haven't experimented with those but i think um i think if you're gonna make that deck good it's probably gonna have to pair with something to be more powerful because from what i've seen it just doesn't end on enough correct me if i'm wrong enough. but i think there's like a bunch of like new like generic xc armored cards or like fish or water cards oh yeah yeah, have, yeah. Right? those like... are i think age of overlord or the set before that there's like this whole line of the rank i think it's a rank three a rank four and a rank five right uh that aren't too bad the xc's armor package yeah yeah and i think um them. from what i understand there's like another wave of support of those things or something that apparently make that like a very very strong engine um so okay. i'm wondering if uh maybe uh goblin mode will be a deck in the future potentially yeah like rank three is probably compared to some of the other levels that you could have access to in your deck rank three is Definitely on the weaker end. You know, you look at like rank twos and you got all the sprite possibilities. You look at rank fours, which basically have everything. Uh, like, I'm not rank being six. biased here, but like, what the hell? Like, no, what do you talk... make? Like, you have two level threes on the board turn one. Like, you want to make the most impactful thing ever. Bro, what do you got, do? You've got Cherubini for like tutoring generic. Threes. Okay, that's not an Xyz. Okay, but it's the three axis, you know? I mean, yeah, but like, then you have to play a deck spe like specifically around like having good targets for Cherubini, which like, what are you going to send? Like, a freaking Phantom Knight? Yeah, I mean, you got the you got disruption with Cicada King. Uh, you've got Levier yeah. with Extenders. Uh, <laughs> just, did you just say Cap? King, dude. <laughs> I, okay, so I didn't say that there are no rank threes in the game. <laughs> what Listen, I said I mention... was the pool is relatively weak, and your argument was they exist. Cicada King. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on <laughs> to the next archetype. Moving on, what would you like to uh, go to next? <laughs> Let's talk about Ashend. All right, Ashend. This is um, a deck which you read that, and I will say uh, I was um, I was very lucky with my pulls. I got a bunch of uh, the Ultra Ashens. Um, what I will say is, and I feel like I hate to reiterate this the same point because I feel like it happens yep. every single time we get a World. Oh, yeah, I know what you're gonna say, and you're right. Yeah. Bro, trust me, this deck is one wave <laughs> away from being insane. <laughs> like... Copium, Copium, just one more wave. Wave two is going to be crazy. Like, g genuinely, like, uh, you know, <laughs> it's it feels like it's got the tools available. So for those who, do, who don't understand what Ashen actually is, I'm sure there was a lot of hype around this. People were very excited to see what does this actually do. Uh, it's an archetype that focuses around, uh, the, I can't even remember the name of the field spell, but the Ashen City or something like that. Obsidim. Um, Obsidim, yeah. So you have this, like, big uh, boss monster called Vados, uh, which kind of like is an anti field spell monster, which you know yeah. lends itself. I have a to... couple things to say about Vados in a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I know where you're going with it. But generally, uh, it's a pyro deck. It's a dark pyro deck. So you know, you <laughs> bonfire is a, a staple in this one as well. Um, although the dark portion of the deck is maybe actually worse um, for it. Um, 
But yeah, they've got like a good like starting like set, right? Like whenever you look at an archetype, you want to see extenders. You want to see guys that special themselves. You want to see guys that just like add cards for free. Um, and it does do it does do a lot of that. Uh, you've got uh, a decent amount of uh, consistency within the few limited, I think like four yeah. cards exist, four or five cards. There's not a lot of them. Um, seven. But I, it's always seven. Oh, has it got that many? It's always uh, TCG archetypes these 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 days is always first wave seven cards second wave seven cards and I know why you you're surprised it's seven and that's one of the the qualities of Ashen that I want to mention yeah because half of them uh, are bad I guess no 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 actually it's the opposite that that's that's what usually happens usually okay. for some reason when they make when they reveal the first seven you look at some of them and you're like okay that card's solid for the archetype and then you look at two or three or four of the first wave and they're all like you can't even think of a universe where you're playing that card, right? And Ashen, the one thing I want to mention, the, the one copium injection that I'm going to give everyone is that in those seven cards, all of them at least have cohesive, like, things that they do for the strategy. And if they ever become good, I think you would play, you would happily play all seven of these cards, even the one trap card that you can get for free off of the Vados, right? Um, the deck is, we don't have to sugarcoat it, as of now, is not playable and 100% relies on a good second wave to make it playable but it has better um let's say what's the word better um chances because of the 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 overall quality of those seven cards is is all right or good rather and with a solid second wave i could see it seeing play but the same at the same time that's 100 still a gamba because if the second wave just isn't good then it's all not worth that much right um, which is really but bizarre I was because surprised. Hmm? Which is just really bizarre though because it's like yeah. I feel like we've seen so many archetypes where the first wave is like like uh, low key. Like, I think the Testina first wave let lend itself to like so much potential, right? Because you had this like deck that sort of was very similar and it relied around this like boss monster, and all they know, needed I, to I, do I... was to make the second wave sort of um, bolster that strategy. Uh, and I mean, it just took like a different direction. You know, like remember when B Trooper got like a second wave, there was like two playable cards. They gave it a fusion for yeah, some reason. It's, I mean, it's yeah. always possible to make a to make a deck viable with a second wave. But I will say, after looking at the Testina cards, there were already a couple of glaring problems, even in the first wave. You know, basing your entire thing around a card that's like a level 10 that doesn't have an effect to even summon itself and all that. I think Tistina already needed a lot more from its second wave than Ashen does. Like you look at Tistina first wave and you're like, second wave needs to be crazy, or this is not, uh, mm. or this is not playable. Ashen is like, is if the second wave it doesn't have to be crazy as long as it's good. Uh, I think I think we're looking at something here because, and that's mainly my main. Uh, the main thing I like about this deck is actually the boss monster Vados is a really cool card that I want to talk about because I don't even think it's uh, it's entirely tied around the Ashen archetype. Um, it's, it would only be a bonus, right, When they if they ever make Ashen good that it has Vados in it because Vados is just generically, I think, a hand trap that could pop up at some point because what it does is it has a quick effect to summon itself by popping a field spell in either spell and traps, uh, in either field zone. So it, you can summon it by popping your own field spell which obviously triggers your Obsidim, like it's based around being destroyed by your own Vados, but you can destroy your opponent's field spells with it as a quick effect. And it doesn't summon itself to your own side of the field, it summons itself to your opponent's side of the field, um, which can, can mess with their zones a little bit, but mainly it's a level 9 monster that says when it's sent to the graveyard, you can blow up the entire field. So it's very awkward for your opponent because you kind of hand them that kind of time bomb right ticking time bomb that if they if they don't get rid of it you can just run over it because it's got 1500 defense and and blow up the entire board and uh it's really hard to get rid of a level nine without sending it to your graveyard because the only way you can do that is basically by overlaying and there's not many decks that play rank nines so um on top of just being a one-on-one -on -one interaction on a field spell you know your opponent activates pearl or rhino your opponent activates the Manadium field spell, like Calarium, your opponent activates the Pearly field spell, your opponent act whichever, you know, like your opponent starts with, mo most decks these days have field spells. So you trade with that field spell, one for one, and you get that, you put the time bomb on their board, right? And technically you could also get the trap card for free, it also does that. Um, that's another question if you want to play the trap card as quote-unquote a brick for, for the Vados, you don't have to, but you could. 
um, and then it would become even better. Well, yeah, but the fact that it's searchable as well makes it like, um, you know, just high potential because if they have any yeah. more cards that, you know, do take advantage of um, yeah. that consistency aspect, then you're going to be able to like, you know, do, do all of these uh, plays that are based around Vados. And I just hope that they focus on that, right? Because sometimes I, it's it's frustrating because they lose a lot of direction oh, with, yeah. uh, oh, no, 100%. with yeah. what the win con. It's like the players look at a archetype and they find a win con and they see very clearly, like, okay, this is the yeah. gameplay loop. This is what this deck is trying yeah. to do. And then they somehow end up designing cards that don't facilitate that at all. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's like with how with Liberal Mancers, it was already established after the first wave, basically, that, okay, the best part about these cards is that they summon themselves from hand, and the best ritual monster is by far Doombroker, right? Like, and we already have a good trap for Doombroker, we don't need more. And then what they make is, like, they make, okay, they make one more guy that summons itself from hand, but other than that, they make, like, five different ritual monsters, they all suck, and they give you three or four different trap cards, which you don't need, because you already have one that's good enough, right? And all we needed was more stuff that leans into what the deck uh, is is missing rather than give it more of what it already has like give it wor more worse trap cards and more worse ritual monsters right very frustrating um whereas with ashen it's the same thing like it's very clear i think the best part about the deck is the fact that vados is both a hand trap against other field spell decks a way to blow up the board and one of your main quote unquote goals right and so it would end up being if it ever was a viable deck it's kind of this sort of haveness effect right where like a card is in your deck anyways, uh, because it's good in your deck, but then sometimes it turns into a hand trap, which just makes your deck better going second, right? And which was the same thing with Havness. Like you would always play Havness, even if it didn't have that hand trap effect, but because it does, you know, every once in a while it, it makes your deck better going second. Yeah, and uh, you know, like I said, hopefully they focus more on that theme of it um, yeah. and don't try and drag it away into like some other like yeah. weird condition. Because uh, I just hope like, they don't let all that amazing artwork go to waste. Because the the, the must uh, be mentioned, yeah, those those references. No, the, to, like, it's very... one of the most beautiful artwork I've seen in a long time on Yu-Gi-Oh cards. Like they look, they look so sick. Without uh, you know, copyright infringing too hard, you know, I think very clearly we saw so many references to things like uh, <laughs> Souls games and. It's, yeah, it's re it's really cool. Those games are appreciated and loved for some of those reasons. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, Ashen a deck. Put a pin on it. Um, this deck is probably, probably. I'll do a prediction. I think it's going to be good. Um, I think there is enough there currently, uh, for it okay. to um, to have something. I'm just going done for with the these future. predictions, man. On the TCG exclusives, it's it feels so it feels <laughs> so fifty fifty. It's so arbitrary. They they decide if they want it to be broken or like or not, and we'll see. But. You know, the the, uh, the the interesting thing is like sometimes when you look at like some of these uh, TCG exclusives, right? Like you can tell from like wave one that if they just give us, because usually what there is, right? Like the usually the telltale sign is they all have like some um, some effect that's part of their card that uh, transfers to all the whole archetype, right? Like I think one of the main mm -hmm. reasons why Burning Abyss was like so good was because. They all had that special summon effect, right? Regardless mm -hmm. of how good the second wave and the third wave was going to be, it was like even if they if they maintained that theme, and even if the the graveyard effects of the wave two or wave three were not that good, it was still okay. going to be part of that win condition of swarming and making uh, multiple Dantes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? Same with the yeah. dangers. Dangers were um, really really good first wave, notoriously. You know, Jackalope. Mm -hmm. um, Bigfoot, I think, was part of it. I think, like, I mean, Jackalope they had, they had Nessie, Nessie right? Jackalope, Bigfoot, um, they had everything. And then they gave us, I think, I want to say, Suchinoko was wave two. Um, uh, but, uh, but then, like... I the... don't think so. I think the first wave was all the broken ones, and then they never made good ones. Oh, okay. After. Like, the, the other ones were all... Like, they knew dangers were already way too powerful, I'm pretty sure. But maybe you're right. I'm not sure. But the main uh, thread that connected all of those was yeah. the reveal to special summon. And so that's mm -hmm. when you got, you know, even though you're playing like, you know, the the fourth, fifth best danger, yeah. Mothman was still like fine. Um, yeah. You know, oh yeah, Chupacabra was wave one, Such was wave two. Oh, yeah, Such was, okay, was, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, so, right. you know, it's a case of like, if they just keep making more of the same thing and then continue mm -hmm. it on, I think we'll definitely be seeing something special. But it's definitely we'll a good quality for an archetype to have like a cohesive strategy or effect that is shared between all of them yeah yep uh all right uh shall we talk about um do you want to mention the yubel goatee stuff at all or uh goatee 
I mean, yeah, I want to mention it. Goatee is like, I think, something that needs experimentation, which I haven't done yet. But I definitely see that those cards are good. And if like, if you're a fan of Goatee, those are probably some of what you was what you were hoping for for those kind of cards, right? Because Goatee, once again, started out as a, as a very mediocre um, TCG archetype. And the, the one thing that can save those archetypes is usually um when they ever get to the ocg and they make new support for them and this is that support uh the cards are okay i think they don't leave us with a they're not like broken but what i will say is like when you play like a rogue deck like that you kind of have like a vision in your mind of like what you think your deck needs and i think those Mm -hmm. goatee cards like fulfilled it really well I think that's they what definitely... I mean. Yeah, it's like if you are already into Godi, you're like, what is this deck missing? Uh, it, it, they feel, they feel on point. But on the other hand, Goti was missing a lot in terms of power level. It, it, it wasn't like barely playable and just needed a little bit. It needed more than that. Um, so what, from what I've seen, without making hmm? it broken, right? I, I think uh, yeah. the new wave like gives it consistency and it gives it a higher yeah. ceiling. But you know, mm-hmm. it's clearly that we're it's no Godi circular. Uh, yeah. But at the same time, like, I think it gives it enough to make it certainly a, a good rogue deck, I think. No, I, I, I would agree with that. I've seen people experiment with different versions. You know, I've seen people throw out, like, Runic Goatee, um, which, you know, all love to the Runic enjoyers. <laughs> and who are so... these people, Josh? You? <laughs> Who's no, putting Runic in Goatee? It's everyone. 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 Talking about. It's the talk of the town. Haven't you heard? <laughs> yeah, everyone's just throwing these Runic cards everywhere. That's crazy. <laughs> this is a side point. You know, I'm going to be playing uh, Runics at my uh, regional this weekend. Oh, now you backpedal. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. <laughs> Those cards all are right. pretty good. Instant fusion and utility. Oh. <laughs> But anyway, yeah, so uh, the Godi stuff is... Uh, Godi has potential, I think. It, it's got potential. It's it's one of those things where what I said earlier of like, it's going to be overshadowed by, you know, fire format. It's really hard to keep up with the fire decks. Um, but eventually, you know, if uh, if the fire decks get hit on a ban list, uh, you know, you you might want to revisit that idea. And and maybe it has a niche in, in formats in the future, right? Uh, U-Bell, on the other hand, I thought was pretty cool when I read them for the first time, the new U-Bell support cards. Uh, at the same time, I don't think they are strong enough, even though they are good legacy support for for a deck from, I don't know, like 15 years ago or more. Uh, I have shout a hard time to, imagining uh, it. Shout out to Vlad anytime uh, he looks at a deck, he somehow manages to like make it somewhat playable like i'm always suspicious of any deck that he looks at because uh he took a look at makanko and then we saw that ridiculous makanko deck suddenly become good he looked at mm-hmm. infernoid however many uh years ago and then ended up topping with it in the middle of like orcus format um mm-hmm. he he just has this talent of managing to pick out and this is one of the decks i know that he's been uh, keeping an eye oh. on uh okay. a a deck that just fusing a, that, that can just like multiple times fuse away your opponent's field uh, they search super poly, right? Yeah, they, that that has to be potential there. You know, like it seems uh it seems not too it bad. It might but... be, and take this with a grain of salt because I haven't tried it. But it might it might put it like my personal prediction is that for an anime deck, it's going to be above average, which oh, might put it yeah, which might put it into like a tier two, tier three kind of situation, which is honestly a lot more than what you would expect from legacy anime support. Which is pretty good for that regard. I, I think that's probably, you know, sometimes as strong of a compliment as you can give, right? Like, it's great for so. an anime deck. <laughs> like, yeah. uh, it I is mean, good. but that is what it is, though, right? I mean, it's, yeah. you're dealing with you bell cards from, like, 15-plus years ago. It's going to be hard to make those meta viable. Um, so they, I think they've did a pretty good job, or they've done a pretty good job at making people consider it and, and maybe give it a shot and maybe even do well with it at local or regional level. Because that's, I think... Um, what I would attest to it is I think that it can do that. I think the uh, most interesting thing here is that the discussion on like how do you do support cards? Uh, because mm-hmm. when you have something that is so old, uh, Naturia was like one of the best examples of it. It's like, like, do you just straight up ignore the deck and just create a new cards and you don't play like... You know, Naturia Runic, you are uh, someone who took that all the way to the World Championship in Macedo. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you didn't play Naturia Cherries or Bamboo Shoot or Stink Bug, did you? Sunflower, though. Sunflower, uh, sunflower yeah. though. Sunflower, though, yeah. You know. Um, Beast. Beast is pretty good. So, yeah, I think uh, <laughs> that's one of the interesting points of Ubel is that you are 
like they did design it in a way where you are trying to go through those nightmare monsters like you are Which cycling is... through them and you are yeah you, that is i mean it's a, it's both it's on the one hand i think it's cool to get to play those very old cards at the same time it always it does make the decks worse by design if you are forced to play those very outdated cards i'm looking at something like gate guardian and it's like of course if you make gate guardian retrains you know like or legacy support uh, you somehow are incentivized to make people play those cards at the same time i don't want to play a, a deck with those cards in it right like i don't want to be forced to play uh, the original three gate guardians in my deck right because that's just going to contribute to breaks because that's just how it works nowadays you draw a freaking kaze Jin. Uh, you know, this is not dual links where they can give us a skill where you can just normal summon that without tributing or something like that. Like that's going to be in your hand and it's going to be dead. So um, I don't know. I, I think it's I, I think you Bell is like on the verge of a card that you could make playable if you give it ways to destroy it in hand, because I think it triggers if you destroy it in hand to summon the other one from the deck. Um, but yeah. I think that's a key point is that whenever old cards are in the equation they more often than not just lead to like being bricks um exactly it, it's right, uh, because they're just outdated they're not being played for a reason yeah you'd have to like start off somewhere like maybe middle of the pack like um things that are open-ended right like if you for example like, it's it's crazy to me to, to think that madolce magellene was printed in 2012 i think yeah, right? probably. something like that yeah, right I so 12. i think 12 yeah, Stratos, for example, years ancient, probably uh, older than some of our viewers. You know what I'm saying? Um, but you, it's a staple. You play it because it's so open ended, yeah. right? So, yeah. uh, and I think like an old school archetype needs like some of those, uh, so, some of those like cards that just have that ability to like you just put like a, you put like a new card in there and it becomes a target and suddenly you know you've got like something special. I mean, so. there's certainly there's certainly old cards that opposed to a gate guardian or something like that have the potential to be meta re relevant again if they ever got you know the the according support because there's a lot of stuff from back in the day that isn't once per turn or you know can be reused like that and just searches or whatever like it's just missing good targets to search uh so like they they can they can just look for those kind of things and incorporate those for other stuff i i, I always like when they don't make me play those old cards like i'm looking at voiceless voice for example like i'm glad that they are not trying to force me to play og skull guardian because <laughs> that's technically part of that archetype too but they just said like yo no we're gonna give up on that like there's no way people are gonna do that like that would never make a good deck and they're right yeah not wrong uh there's one more archetype that i wanted to uh talk about before we uh before we uh, wrap up here uh what we will do however is i will ask the twitch chat here who are currently live with us for those of you who are listening on spotify or whatever do make sure you follow us on the socials uh, so you can yeah. watch both of us live. But I'm going to ask them to give us some uh, questions relating to Phantom Nightmare. Uh, mm -hmm. If there's anything you want to pick out and uh, ask us specifically in terms of Phantom Nightmare, uh, do ask it away now. Uh, and while you're doing that, let's move on to one of the final decks that I think is definitely worth talking about. Uh, Labyrinth, I think, okay. is uh, yeah. probably one of the... Uh, yeah, I was going to I was going to wrap it up with instead of like I uh, cuz I was going to talk about some miscellaneous cards, you know, some here and there that are not an entire archetype. So I guess this leads right, into we that can, because uh, we we can do both of that, yeah, as we get these Yeah, yeah. I mean this, this is also Labyrinth because Labyrinth doesn't get a new Labyrinth card. It, it is just one miscellaneous card which is uh the Black Goat laughs. In, <laughs> the Black Goat is is the, go. is the the name that they gave that card. Um which is a normal trap card that is relatively interesting for Labyrinth. And if you read it for the first time, it maybe doesn't sound that great because all it does on the field, it's like you declare a card name, a monster card name, and then for the rest of this turn, both players can't special summon monster with that name except from the graveyard. That's it, right? You just name a card uh, and can't be special summoned for the rest of the turn. Uh, and then it also has a graveyard effect that lets you banish it from the graveyard, declare a monster card name, and they, the, neither player can activate the effects of that monster um, for the rest of the turn. You can only use one of the two effects of that card. Obviously, the reason why that card is really good in Labyrinth is because it both has a very powerful field effect. Because if you really think about it, that effect is more impactful than you would think. Because you just declare... You can think of a deck and you just think of one... You can, all, you can think of one name that you can call against the deck and it, it's just it just almost completely shuts it off like you can call snake eyes ash against snake eye 
or uh, you can even call Diabell Star after they use Wanted. You can call whatever. You can call extra deck monsters with it too. Like you can call uh, whichever extra deck monster you think is most vital to your opponent. You call Pearly against the Pearly deck, they can they can't do anything. Uh, you call Turbulence against Rescue Ace. You call whatever, right? You can think of a you can think of a good name to call against every th- single deck, and it almost stops them from completely playing. Uh, on top of that. It has a very unique quality for Labyrinth, which is a good graveyard effect, which means it's just the perfect discard for furniture. That's just that the 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 uh, that is worth a lot for that deck. Yeah, so this is the uh, direction that we're taking, I think, with uh, the quote unquote power creep of the game is like trap cards um, inherently are just not going to be very good um, on yeah. the field, right? Uh, we saw yeah. the development with Infinite, Infinite Impermanence, just giving it like, I mean, that card could potentially just be a monster, right? Uh, by and large. Uh, but one thing we're yeah. seeing uh, being developed is uh, the Black Goat is kind of underwhelming. It doesn't, like, it's not crazy, right? Because it's a trap card, yeah. you have to win the dice roll, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But because of the fact that it has now a bonus effect, depending on the location it's on, which is the grave here, which is exactly where all of your furniture is dumped to, you now get multi-layered uses of this card. If you go first, you can declare a card, potentially shutting down their entire deck, and then again on their opponent's turn, uh, sorry, not, not on that turn, because it is one effect per turn. Is it? Is it yeah. one effect per turn? Yeah, it it's one effect, one effect per turn. It is one effect per turn. You still get that utility on, on the future turn. Or yeah. if you lose a dice roll and you're going second, you can get a big welcome from your deck, activate the Black Goat, and then you can uh, stop them from the, from using that uh, from using a monster. So I think that it's probably I don't want it's 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 strange using the term healthy, uh, but I think it's definitely prob I want to say probably the correct direction to take trap design. Um, mm-hmm. And this is obviously something we, we can definitely talk about this as like a whole podcast subject because I think it's very interesting yeah. to talk about control decks. Oh no, trap cards in general are something to talk about in modern yeah. Yu-Gi-Oh for sure. Yeah. But yeah, this is this is kind of the uh, direction they're taking. Um, I think one of the uh, more frustrating factors is that <clears throat> depending on the deck, this can definitely feel like a a floodgate essentially, right? Like if, if you call... Oh like, yeah, the no, right... it's, it, is, it is what people refer to as a it, lingering yeah, floodgate. Is. Mm-hmm. And uh, while it is, I mean, it's I, I wouldn't call it as impactful as something or as toxic as something like a D barrier because in, as opposed to thing, shutting though. off, it depends, right? It just depends on. It the depends on the right? deck. Yeah, it depends on the deck. But like for the most part, like for example, you're thinking like, okay, your opponent activates a runic quick play spell and you call Hugin, right? That's huge. That's impactful. They can't summon Hugin for the rest of the turn, but they still get to summon something, right? If you compare that to Flipping a D barrier against Runic or flipping a D barrier against Branded, right? Like it, it doesn't quite compare. Like there's, for most decks, there's going to be ways around it. And if your deck doesn't have ways around it, uh, your deck was probably too weak in the to begin with, right? Because at that point, it, you're basically saying, "Hey, my 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 deck has this one choke point. If I can't do that, I can't play the game." Yep, exactly. Um, and, you know, maybe one day in the future, an archetype of just, you know, harpy ladies where every card has the same name or something. Like, if you declare it, it just, <laughs> you just shuts black it down. Goat. I don't think harpy that works, lady. though, actually, because I think it's original name, right? Um, yeah, original name. Never mind. So I don't think that would actually work. Uh, but yeah, um, a deck that has, like, one specific monster as part of its uh, choke point, I think this card is, like, yeah, low I mean, key, yeah, no, the, the, those examples that I just said are very valid because the card yeah. has multiple purposes. Like, it, it can act <laughs> as sort of a hand trap if you draw furniture. Like, you go, your opponent goes to summon Turbulence and you just pitch the Black Goat for a furniture, call Turbulence. They can't activate it for the rest of the turn. That's the choke point, the major choke point of the deck. And you can't dodge that. That's another thing. Like, you can't, like, make an SP to to play around an imperm you can't uh set up uh whatever right like uh you you can't do anything to it like you if if you're playing rescue ace and your opponent discards that you're not resolving turbulence you can't you can't do it there's no at least that i'm aware of there's no way to to kind of outplay this card and and pre- and prevent it from stopping you from doing that so labyrinth i think uh good summary by the way um yeah, yeah so i i think uh labyrinth is uh, definitely uh, one of the like actual budget options, right? Like, I don't think this deck is. Oh, I don't know about that. What's I big, don't know what, about that. What's big welcome at these days? Like fifteen? Uh, that that thing is. I don't think that's cheap, and especially if you're looking at an extravagance version with uh, multiple chaos angels and SPs and stuff. I. Hmm. Hmm. 
They all say I, I'm looking up Big Welcome right now, but I don't think uh, we're looking at a budget deck. So Big Welcome is Big oh, Welcome is like fifteen. Three okay, listen. Okay, you know, guys, there's a big difference between optimizing and making a budget. <laughs> okay, right? I mean, like, yeah, okay. If you're playing, right. if you're not playing extravagance, sure. Uh, let's say you need on, you still need like one SP, one Chaos Angel, most likely. You need Typhon, uh, like even in the Prosperity version, right? And then it's, I, I mean, it's yeah. Compared to Fire, you're probably right in the grand scheme of things. I don't think I wouldn't consider it a cheap deck. Yeah, I mean, like, realistically, I, so so just to preface, I think, like, in general, this is an expensive format, right? Like, regardless of oh, yes. what kind oh, of... Oh, uh, 100%. Yeah. What, no, and rollback also, by the way, is expensive. Oh, yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, that's a, that's an important part. So I think, like, irrespective of what deck you're... Like, because usually, like, sometimes format to format, there'll be, like, an absolute, like, dirt cheap deck, like, pennies. Um, And I don't know if this yeah. format really has... I mean, technically, any deck, like, you could play right now, you know, it's just never going to be, con uh, you know, contendable. Um, I think it's going to be shifter decks if you're talking like penny flew decks. under right like yeah I think that's the kind of the situation that we're in mm. is like if you're actually looking for the cheapest uh mm. I think there's two options quote unquote that three I guess uh you have shifter decks you have some runic variations and ironically they're not going to be great against um fire decks but they're okay if you go first with the runic deck you can definitely beat uh the fire decks uh, and maybe with the right board breakers going second, I don't know, I haven't tried it yet, but that is looking to be relatively cheap. And then the last thing you have would be, what was I thinking, branded maybe, uh, isn't the most expensive at the moment. Uh, plants are uh, kind of on the radar, I think, recently um, with the uh, some of the new Aroma cards. Uh, yeah. did, they, did they get that tour guide card in the set? They did get the aroma support. Don't ask me exactly what they do because I don't <laughs> want to talk about it. Yeah, so I know some players in the uh, in, is are, are going to be very excited about the uh, plant support <laughs> here. Um, and uh, I don't know too much about the deck, but with the what was it like? Is it dry ass that got limited or something? Right? What did they do to it? Some toxic cards are on the ban list now. <laughs> dry, dry ass toxic, by the way. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, I think Aroma will uh, eventually be labbed out and, uh, you know, popularized. Yeah, they, by they got, they got some, some potential for sure. The new cards are not bad. I know that. I don't remember exactly what they do, but I think they are solid. Yeah. Yeah, I think they have like a tour guide style card, which is like very strong. Um, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but they might be going into a more. Uh, aroma engine right rather than like they, you know, from what i've vines. seen uh from what i've seen long story short they can still make the same stuff happen as before but they just need to play a couple more engine requirements in the deck because they go through some of the error mage cards and stuff like that like don't don't exactly quote me on the combo lines but that's what i've seen and heard is that you can you can do the same stuff as before you just need a couple more uh you know extra steps that require some more bricks in the deck but i mean that has never stopped anyone from touching that deck right so and it's never going to stop anyone from reading it either. <laughs> so we'll have to see what happens at the next EU event specifically. Yeah, that's doomed. All right, before we before we wrap this up, I want to, I guess, give a couple honorable mentions to a couple of one of miscellaneous cards that I think are solid. You got, uh, and give my opinion or our opinion on them. There's the new level two sprite support EMP Meow Mine, yeah. which is a solid card, I think. Yeah, that's uh... uh it's cool. It's it, it ain't gonna replace no sprite elf, I'll tell you that much, but it's <laughs> got some pretty good synergy with SP Little Knight. So it gives sprite end boards a little bit more oomph, you know. It's something you can it can, you can use it as an extender from hand, uh, but you can also send it for sprint and it's got some some utility in the graveyard. So I'm a fan of that card. Um, even though I I doubt it's gonna make it good enough to compete at the top level, but I am a fan of the card regardless. Uh, another card that I personally like a lot is Mutamorphosis. Uh, basically, it's like reverse metamorphosis, right? It tributes backwards a, metamorphosis. It tributes yeah. an extra deck card to someone one of the same level from the main deck. It's a fusion or synchro specifically that you need to tribute, and you summon any monster from the same deck with the same from the from the from your deck with the same level. Uh, and it's not negated, so it's a very generic card that has a lot of potential. I feel like for the future, obviously, the first thing that comes to my mind is the fact that, uh, you know, one of the decks that summons fusion monsters the easiest is Runic, so you can, like, use it in all sorts of Runic decks to tutor out whichever level you want, you know? Things that come yeah. to mind is, like, if you play, like, Runic Sprite, maybe with Fur Hire, like, that card you can get 
whatever missing piece, right? You miss your, you don't, you, you don't have Rex in your hand. You can get it by tributing Hugin. You don't have access to the sprite cards. You can get that, right? And so like a card that while relatively cheap at the moment and probably not going to be played in the near future has a lot of potential, I think, at some point. Like it's definitely a good card. I like to call uh, these decks, I like to refer to them as database decks, right? Like it's whoever is uh, going to be putting in the homework to really I mean, maximize yeah, I mean, the, the potential. This card, this card tutors like any level two, level three, level four, level five, or level nine are yeah. the levels we have for Runics, right? And so like there has to be something you can do, so, right? So Runics are already a solid engine. Uh, and this is going to make whatever you are trying to tutor more consistent. Does it, so does there, it e-tail? There does, has it like, to be or, does it like remove it at the end of the turn or anything like that? Or it would be returned to the hand during the end phase. Right, okay. Because, like, one thing I was, like, skeptical, skeptical about was, like, usually, you know, these kind of nonsense cards, they, they generally, they would just take advantage of something printed 15 years ago, right? Like, you mm -hmm. would just tutor out, like, an Eret Test Newman or something like that, but it does have the... <laughs> okay, uh... you, you can't set up a floodgate like that. Funnily enough, in the OCG, you can, like, tribute Hugin, and if you get Maxied, you can, like, bounce your own Maxi. Funny, funny stuff you can do. That's that's hilarious! Wow, that is so yep. funny. Count, counter see them. <laughs> okay, yeah. So database cards like that. Um, maybe we'll see someone break it. Uh, and mm -hmm. really take advantage of the uh, targets there. You know, things like small world. Uh, these are these are the kind of cards where, uh, I think that's really gonna lend itself well to uh, mm -hmm. uh to some real homework in the database there. And I mean, I yeah. think like probably as you mentioned, like Runic just has to be the best deck for that kind of card. It's right? definitely if you the easiest be playing it. at the moment. Like it's definitely the one where. I don't want to put this card into my deck and then have to hope that I can summon a fusion or synchro because that in most decks requires multiple cards, right? The, the only deck that I can think of that just spams out fusions like no problem and is always going to be able to make that card live is Runic. Mm. All right. All right. Um, other other notable mentions. Uh, Horus gets more consistent because they get an, a field spell there. that can search him city. Oh, there's a field spell in here as well. What's the, uh, the, the, is the main deck guy good? Is he played now? The main deck guy is not that good. Yeah. Uh, sometimes they can, they you can play one, but the, that's the 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 weak point about the support is that the new Horus monster is not actually that great. I think the biggest deal is the field spell because the biggest issue with Horus was always what do you do if you don't have sarcophagus or Imseti? And the field spell allows you. First of all, it counts as King Sarcophagus while it's face up, um, and also it lets you during your main phase add a Horus monster from deck to hand, and then you have to place a card from your hand to the bottom of your deck. But uh, it just means you can search Imseti, and that's huge. Yeah. Okay. Um, I uh, we're we're at our one hour thirty here, so uh, we'll be wrapping right. up. Very gonna, shortly. There's there, uh, there's even more I would like to talk about, but I guess uh, if anything else is there, you know, you can let me or you can let us know any other quote unquote stars in the in the pack that we missed out on. But I think we we touched on almost all the important stuff. Um, if there's anything else you guys are excited about, make sure to, you know, let us know. Yeah, we're definitely going to be having some, uh, some, um, discussions that are more evergreen, uh, which might be what happens next week. Uh, although I think we could potentially do like a Phantom Nightmare part two, uh, going over like the weekend's, um, you know, uh, happenings. We'll probably only really have regionals and stuff. Most notably, I'll have my regional this weekend, so I'll report back, uh, <laughs> Next Ooh, what episode. are you gonna play? Oh, Runic! You said you said Runic. Yeah, Runic. I'm playing Runic Raid Raptor. Raid Raptor. Yes, it is oh, a. Oh God! Uh, Wait, what? is that support in Phantom Nightmare? Yeah, it's got the uh, the new quick play uh, rank up card, which is it's okay. Like... So we've done we've done like an hour and a thirty minutes podcast on the new set, and you haven't mentioned a single time the deck that you're gonna play the week after. I just don't think it's very good, but like okay. <laughs> it's uh it's it's very fun. Uh, Raid Raptor. Uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna be talking about it too much in case someone listening at my regional. Uh, you know, no, I'm kidding. Oh, um, okay, that's oh, all right. Yeah, no, we're no, no, hiding no. information. No, no, right, no, don't worry. It's uh, so basically the way the deck works. Uh, the reason um shout outs to Yasin because he was the one who like I think has been popularizing this. Um, it's basically all the runic cards are full utility. Uh, and any generic two level fours on the field is full combo. Um. So Raider's Knight up into Brave Strix, uh, and the way the new support works is uh, you have uh, Brave Strix, the new rank 5, it just searches literally any, basically any Raid Raptor spell or trap from the deck, um, and then you're also um, putting all of your power onto this uh, new boss monster, Rising Rebellion Falcon. 
It is an unaffected monster that burns and destroys all cards your opponent controls. It's absolutely crazy. Uh, and the way you get this out is by tutoring the Quick Play spell, the Quick Play Rank Up, which is essentially a synchro of XC monsters. You, you, <laughs> you use all of the monsters in your graveyard or banish or field, and you combine a level 4 plus a 4 plus a 5 to make 13, that makes Rising Rebellion Fal Falcon, which destroys all cards your opponent controls and uh, burns them and is unaffected. Um, and you end on two of them. So <laughs> that's uh, that's what I'm playing. I'm just yapping right now. <laughs> I am indeed yapping. I'm very excited. I can't wait. <laughs> Long story um, short, birds are always bad for Yu-Gi-Oh. Yeah. Uh, there was a new card in Phantom Nightmare uh, related to Wing Beast Enjoyers. The, uh, I, I forgot the name, but it's the quick play. Oh, it's the quick play that lets you dodge Valor in flu, yeah. Yeah, you could also tribute from your hand as well, which is like kind of random. Um, but that just gives it even more uh, searchability because like you could just get rid of so, like a brick out of your hand or something, and then just get. Yeah, there's a uh... lot of stuff in this set. It's a really cool set, I think. I like it, even though I think from the vendor's perspective, it's not going to be that crazy because most of the secret rares aren't that expensive, which is good for the community though. Um, and some of it is overshadowed by um, fire, obviously. Um, but I, I I think it's a very exciting set overall still. Yeah, uh, what I will say is Phantom Nightmare doesn't feel like the biggest game-changing set ever if it wasn't specifically just for, like, one... I mean, like, okay, I was about two, to say, yeah, okay. Like, there's, like, the Poplar and the Princess go without saying. Um, yeah. You know, and I think that's huge in and of itself, but when you're considering, like, two out of, like, a hundred cards... Um, yeah. Like, the relative, like, power of just, like, you know, the set um, is obviously kind of skewed in favor of, like, these two cards boosting it significantly. Mm -hmm. But the average of the set is like it's good. Like there's a lot of like neat, cool uh, things. In, going in on. some ways, yeah, even though I am a fan of the Snake Eye deck and I am looking forward of, to the format, I think it's going to be it's, it's going to be a good format. Uh, in some ways, it would be more exciting if we didn't have that because there's a lot of stuff in there that would be exciting to be experiment with uh, if it wasn't for you know obviously everything is going to be worse than the Fire deck probably right, which is kind of like a uh, a, a damper in that regard, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. Um, I was trying to pick out some questions from the Twitch chat just to round off here. All right. uh, I didn't get too many. Um, there was someone who asked, uh, what do we think about Manadium going into Phantom Nightmare? I think we touched a lot on the uh, hand trap and the metagame lineup of the yep. defensive cards that people will be running. And I think the problem with Manadium is that it's going to be caught in the crossfire of a lot of Shifter yeah. decks trying to beat Snake Eye. Um, and Shifter being very, very uh, strong against Snake Eye is naturally going to hurt Manadium. Uh, and I think at least in the early part of the format, I do envision a lot of people trying to play Droll, which is... Yeah, that card no, is absolutely. Uh, it's, it's both Droll and Nibiru are going to be decently popular because Nibiru actually has some value against Snake Eye depending on how well they play around it or if you're able to pair it with a different hand trap. But in general, uh, there's a couple... There, The problem is that Manadium isn't really great against both of the approaches that people could be taking against Snake Eyes. It's either people are going to overload on hand traps, which is not going to be good for you, or another card that's very popular is Super Polymerization, which, depending on which targets they run, can completely mess up Manadium as well. Like, that's one of the few cards with the right extra deck. You can just, uh, you can just plow through a Manadium board. And I just don't think Manadium is going to have a great time. You know, it's not particularly good going second, not particularly good going first if everyone plays a decent amount of hand traps or super polys. And so I don't even... Yeah, Shifter would be one reason, but I, I think it's more like the, gen, the general environment of the format is not going to be that good for Manadium. That being said, it's Manadium. Like, if it goes first, it's still scary. Like, even throwing one hand trap at it is often not enough, maybe two... Uh, like it's still a scary deck and it's going to be viable. It's not worse than most of the stuff that we've talked about. I just don't think it's at the top of the, of the game. Yeah. I think the, uh, hand traps is like whatever for the deck. It plays through them so well. It's the issue is those lingering. Somewhat, uh, but if it gets to critical mass, I think it hurts. Yeah, potentially. Um, it's those lingering ones that are really, uh, really bad, but Hey, listen, that's something that is going to affect every deck. I think going forward, yeah. especially, uh, especially things that are non snake eye variants. Mm -hmm. um did you manage to pick out any questions here did you see any specifically uh, do, to phantom Nightmare? i guess I'm, I'm just looking at chat right now do you guys think any of the very powerful cards like sp are already targets for the ban list 
People love talking about the, uh, the, the as soon as, like, good card is released, like, okay, yeah. how are we going to hit it? Like, you know, like, can we, like, play with the card for a little bit? Because I really want to play Snake Eye maybe in, at some round of uh, reprints, you know? I'm coping that Rarity Collection 2 will just reprint Bonfire and all of the... Uh, okay, that the, is a massive round of copium right I am, there. I am coping real deep. hard. Uh, so you know. uh, I, I think I think it would be very I like the thing about SP Little Knight is that with those kind of cards, uh, there's only one way to hit them if you wanted to have any impact, and that would be to ban it. Like there's no way limiting that card would ever do something. Of course, some decks play two for a reason, but at the same time, like I would say 90% of SP Little Knight's impact comes from the first copy, maybe even more. Um, if they ever wanted to get rid of that card, they would have to ban it. And I think at this point in time. I just don't see that happening. Uh, and I also wouldn't want it to happen because even though SP Little Knight is incredibly powerful, I've been enjoying a lot of the gameplay that it creates because it's not powerful because it's like omni-negating everything or immediately winning the game on the spot. It's a very interactive card. So yeah, it's very powerful, but it creates uh, a lot of cool interactions. And, then, and on top of that, I think banning a card that people have spent at this point in time, 100 bucks per copy, so early would just not be I, I just don't think it would be smart because people would definitely not enjoy that let's say like that the uh extra deck podcast i think definitely has to come at some point um, oh yeah no we're that's for a, sure gonna other, go yeah. over that in depth at some point but um yeah. i think one of the um my I, I i've always looked at it this way i think that anything that makes going second better is kind of free reign for me like i thought zeus mm -hmm. was one of the best at a uh things they could have uh, added to the extra deck. Uh, oh, yeah. Typhon. I love, I love Typhon even more. Yeah, Typhon. Um, it was weird. Typhon hasn't been as good as I thought it would be. It's definitely strong, and I think you will be playing it. Um, I just, yeah. you know, it's it's definitely like no Zeus, right? Um, so I, I really yeah. think like go sec anything that helps like go second is always strong. And SP Little Knight kind of like bridges the gap between both, right? I think it's really good, you know, going first yeah. and second. Uh, so that, yeah. that's why I really like it. Um, and in terms of limitations, it's very rare that hitting things in the extra deck actually does anything unless you outright ban them, right? Yeah, um, exactly. Historically, I think like, you know, gosh, um, limiting Electromite like was actually very relevant. <laughs> um, limiting Shooting Riser is the most outrageous one. Oh my God, I forgot that happened. Yeah, exactly. Is that still at one? It, no, I think they removed it. Like what? Like I, I, dude, Mike, my, my, I genuinely think like that was like a typo. Like someone, <laughs> like just yeah, put in the intent. wrong dragon. Like that's so. Like that. What was that? I, I don't know. It's it's. It made no sense. No one even played multiples. Yeah, like the only cards that relevantly should be limited are things like Saryuja, uh, or Psyframe Omega, right? Like, cause like if your deck Those is like, yeah. yeah, like if your if your deck is summoning like multiples of like you know Trishula is summoning multiples of Blavnir. like those like your deck I mean, is that, not those doing... are mostly they, they all have one thing in common is that it's mostly old cards that are lagging lacking once per turn right and that's the reason why nowadays modern extra deck cards if you want to get rid of them you'd have to ban them because most of them are once per turn anyways so like mm -hmm. you're not going to need multiples most of the time all right, uh, before we get too off topic on a tangent here, ladies and gentlemen, thank you uh, so much for tuning in once again to another subject. This is our first ever uh, podcast on a set release and a set reveal. Yep. Um, we'd love to hear your feedback on how you feel about the structure of this. Did you like that we went through archetype by archetype? Would you prefer to have seen us pick out cards? Um, any kind of feedback with regards how you want us to approach the next core set or the next side set, probably. I'm sure we'll do one for every relevant set. Um, yeah. will be, uh, will be definitely much appreciated. So yeah, do let us know down in the comment section. Um, and yeah, thanks for tuning in and any, uh, closing statements. No, they said it all perfectly. Appreciate you all for listening. Uh, looking forward to you guys' feedback and hope you enjoyed the episode. See you next week or listen to you next week. Goodbye.